Your dog hasn't barked once. Just because she's in a cage. Why is that? Is she? Yeah, but shouldn't that make her to bark more? When my no. dog goes in the cage, there's a lot of whining. No. Like, get me out of the cage. See, your dog's happy in a cage? She's fine in the cage. She yeah. knows it's her, It's her like, sec- sacred spot when she needs to go by herself. <sighs> See that? She goes in there, and so when I put her in there, she also knows. It's funny, because I have a whole philosophy on... On dogs and kennels? On the zen? No, on my clients. It's called creating the puppy. <laughs> Wait, we, gotta, we can totally talk about that. Well, okay, because we're rolling right now. <laughs> you are listening to A Chatter of Fact. Uh, again, these are not conversations. Or, or No, sorry, these are not interviews. They are conversations. Wow, flip that, scratch that, reverse it. Um, Megan Estrada, say hello to everybody. Hey, everybody. Listen, here's the thing, people. You guys know that I do all these events, and you guys know I talk to the events, and I, I, or I talk about the events. I've talked to people who perform at these events and do different things at the events. I've yet to have an event overlord on the show. This is your first time hearing a self made individual. Her story goes from like photography to singing everywhere around and about, and she's really good at this game because let me tell you, we were just talking about it before we got on the mics. Event planning is not a hobby. You have to really master it like any craft if you really want to do it right. And we have a mastermind on the mic for you and yours. And you know, another thing, we're outside, so you're going to hear, I think, a jet. You're going to hear a jet. You're going to hear wind. You're going to hear leaves falling. And you're also going to hear great stories because if you're planning events, not only do professional tips come along with that, but you can't plan an event and do this for a living without having some funny, strange stories that we'll both share with you on that. Uh, and that about covers that. So say hello to Megan. How are you? I'm good. Uh, How are you? Yeah, I'm just dandy now. We've got a beautiful day here, We have too. a beautiful day. We're, so we're, we're kind of at the outside screen porch at Megan's you know mighty household. And she's got everything a person could ever ask for in her backyard. The hammock, man. And I never use any of it really? because Did, I'm working all the time. Isn't that that? It's that and like hot tubs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pe- I used to have a hot tub at my last house. Did you use it? Never. Never. Yeah. I and then a, some cats moved in underneath, and like we're living out of the hot tub, <laughs> like feral cats. Was it an outdoor? Yeah, it was an outdoor hot tub. Okay. And they lived out of it, and I don't think I think it's it's probably still there, and it's never been used. The problem is, man. On paper, it's a great idea. Absolutely. But in execution, it's like a vegetable garden. So everybody, every year I have this idea that I'm going to create a vegetable garden and I'm going to like, this is great. I'm going to grow vegetables. It'll be like soothing for the soul. And then I plant everything. And then I am busy all summer because that's what our industry is busy all summer. And then I come back a month later. I'm like, oh, shoot. And that's when you have to like. Everything's dead. That's when, <laughs> that's when you have to give all the time to like summertime's probably a big deal, right? When you're like doing whatever people with green thumbs do, but you can't do. Yeah, I have no time for that. I don't have time for hobbies. What's funny is I was talking to you about how I don't try to make too many of these things timeless, but there's something timeless about what we're going through because I, I haven't really talked too much about how COVID's affect affected our industry, you know. But what's cool about this is uh, I always talk about the fact that people seem to download um, these shows even years after the fact. Mm-hmm. So, And thanks, all you people. I don't know who you are, but thank you for listening. I appreciate you. You guys are great. Cheers to you. Um, but anyway, the good thing about this is not only will it be that little historical footprint, you know, five years from now somebody can, you know, Mommy, how did the event people handle COVID? Well, now they're going to hear it. But besides <laughs> that, this is a timeless subject because... In events, there's always something. There's always going to be something that you have to overcome. There's some some shit's going to happen that you can't Mm -hmm. control. So this isn't just, uh, it won't be us just talking about COVID so much as it'll be us talking about how you handle stuff when it happens. You know what I mean? Well, events are managed chaos. Yeah, that's well put. Oh, you see? Yes, so event planning is managed chaos. You basically have to just embrace that this is all chaos. You have all these people coming together, Uh. getting together like from different places they're all in different schedules and then we're having to corral them and i call it kind of like herding cats <laughs> because i mean you get a few drinks in somebody you right. have them socializing with other people nobody's going to pay attention to your itinerary your, your your plan for the night but yet at the same time you have to keep everybody on plan because every vendor is getting paid by the minute so oh, wow. it's like it's like herding cats so i call it managed chaos because it really is your talent of having to figure out how to work with people because it's it's a major event. It's always a major event because we tend to we're lucky enough to work for some high end clients. 
but it's being run or planned first off. You know, the, the clients themselves are typically not people that know how to run events. And then you add the fact that it's a huge event so that, you know, it's something that means something to them typically, like a wedding or something. So then the stress factor starts to grow. I've seen the nicest people get like just a little crazier. Have you noticed that? Like as they get closer to the day, it's like, oh, you were, you were, you know, some people get a little, a little nuts. I mean, I did it. I had a huge Mm -hmm. release party for a CD and I had it planned to the nine. And then I think like, 10 minutes before driving to the place I, I was like at my you know in-law's house and I think I was like snapping at my mother-in-law which was the sweet, sweetest lady ever about nothing because it got so close that my nerves got to me because it was my release party and like oh, I'm like I don't know maybe we will have enough tables you know I like what? there's no reason to yell at her but I think you're dealing with people who aren't professionals at this but want a hand in it and then you're dealing with people who are also planning something that means a lot to them. So then there's that emotional aspect. Yeah. And then there's booze. And then there's booze, which makes everybody crazy. <laughs> so. Well, the, my goal in event planning is actually to make this process of the client, the client goes through, be really seamless and easy for them. Mm-hmm. Because I call it like I create the client and I create great clients by providing this management of them from the very beginning all the way to the end. Yeah. So they, most of my clients say the week, you know, the week going into the wedding, they're really mellow and calm because we have not only told them what was going to happen a year out when we first started having a conversation, but they know exactly what to expect all along the way because of really effective communication. And that's how I, I call it creating great clients. You create them by managing their expectations throughout the process. That's super smart. I haven't heard that before. That's well played, man. All right, Thanks. wait a minute. So okay. then we're going to back this all the way up. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get your story. So where'd you grow up? I grew up in Winnetka, which is, happens to be where my office is, too. Where you're what? My office. Really? So I, I ah, came nice. right back. And that just south of Chicago, folks, for you. Or north of Chicago. North, north, north sorry. Chicago. God. It's the yeah. North Shore, Chicago. Close, too. Which my company's called North Shore Weddings mm-hmm. and Events. And I, I grew up here. I live right now a mile and a half from my mom's house. My <laughs> office is four <laughs> blocks from the house I grew up in. My mom's house. And it's hysterical because I was like the last person that anyone thought, one, would move back to the suburb that I grew up in. Yeah. And two, would be a wedding planner. Really? Oh, I'm the last person anyone ever thought. Well, cause, and Winnetka's nice, by the way. I like Winnetka. Nice. It's, it's Yeah. Well, wait a minute. So what was what was your first jam then? Why, why did people think that you wouldn't have done this? What, what were they... What was well, your thing? What were you known as? Well, I mean, when I was in high school, I wore like a dog collar and like goth clothing and like heavy <laughs> eyeliner. And I was like really into um, like industrial music yeah. and then really into like EDM. We didn't call it EDM back then. We called it house music and techno. Yes. But uh, yeah, I was just into like rock and I was into music, but I was a photographer. So I went from the age of 14. I really was heavily focused on photography. I did for photography all through high school. It was like my focus. Wow. And my goal was to be the next Annie Leibovitz. So, like, that's who I wanted to be when I was in high school. So, I just my 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 thought process was like the last thing I thought about was weddings. Mm-hmm. That seemed to me that was like for the girls with the really nice handwriting and the really well kept notebooks. <laughs> you know, that is like really proper and contr- and. and what I found out later is that being a great event planner, you have to know about parties. And I actually, throughout my life, really understood the dynamics of parties. I want to see pictures eventually. <laughs> I want to see goth you. I'll, sh- I'll show you a picture. I used to ha- I had a shaved head with a big red star, bl- bleach blonde with a big red star dyed in it in my rave days. So that That's was fantastic. Hysterical. Wait, did you say you, you even sang for a minute? Or no? Yeah, well, I, I started off, so I left high school and I started shooting photography in the rave industry. Mm-hmm. So I was going to rave parties in college and I was going to school for photography and I really, nobody was capturing this. And so I figured out, well, maybe I should start taking pictures at these rave parties. Like, obviously something's happening that's worthwhile. And, yeah. I, and I thought it was really interesting with the light shows and the performers and the people's outfits and... It was just very, it was very meant to be captured by photography. So I started shooting and I reached out to all the promoters and I, uh, 
and I would call their voicemail and leave them a message because back then we didn't have cell phones if yeah. you remember like we had pagers right and then if you went to a rave party you'd call the you call the voicemail and you'd get the directions the day of the of the event of the party so i called the voicemails and left messages on all the rave promoters voicemails and i got people to start picking me up and then they started letting me into parties and i started shooting parties wow and then i started um getting i had magazines that picked me up and i was working for all these different national magazines that wanted coverage on the rave and club industry so i was like 20 years old shooting the rave and club industry i wasn't even allowed in the clubs <laughs> and i was like on the guest list like sneaking in yeah. shooting photography oh, and cool. um and in, totally integrated into that club world and that's what I loved. And I loved the music industry. That was really my passion. So I eventually started. Man. Yeah. And then I eventually started doing music um, throughout that time period. But really, my start in the music industry was shooting photography for it. I did not know this. This is awesome. So then you're doing that. And then uh, that's a- at least you're capturing something. So it's mm-hmm. like it's like the wild cousin to wedding planning, I su- I would imagine. Like you're capturing something. So there's there's yeah. something. It's peripheral, you know, but it's it's something related in in a way, I guess. But then how do you Well, I I take my photography experience. So, you know, I talk to photographers in the events industry all the time because yeah. I joke with them. I'd be like, "I used to shoot slide film in the dark." <laughs> Which is really hard if you're a photographer. That's <laughs> really hard. I like, Because I, I had to shoot slide film for the magazines. What does that mean, slide so film? So slide film is really delicate. So when you're shooting, first of all, shooting film is much harder than shooting digital. Everybody shoots digital these days. But yeah. We didn't have digital. We didn't have digital cameras in 2000, 1999. So <laughs> I was shooting slide film in the dark. Because you got to remember these like, I was like focusing on the light on the techniques you know, yeah. the turntables, there's a little light that pops up and goes onto the, onto the record. Uh-huh. And that's how I would focus to make sure that I would get the re- manually focus on the DJ and get the shot because there was no light on the DJ. So it was really an interesting, it was a really interesting time period to work within. And I learned a lot about photography that I now use in my work you know, planning events because photography is a huge portion of the day for a wedding or an event. Yeah. Um, particularly for the weddings. And, you know, I just have a really in-depth understanding of lighting and how photographers shoot and how they direct people. It's just innately, you know, part of the process. So I, i really feel like I take that part of my life and I apply it to event planning. So what's the connect then? That's crazy. Like how do you end up in the wedding industry all of a sudden did you shoot a wedding because someone asked and then it kind of was that your gateway what what was the no i (laughs) woke up one day when i was like 20 20 years old i think i woke up realized i didn't want to be a photographer i just really liked my subject matter (laughs) (laughs) and so i really i really had been writing music as a singer and writing lyrics for years and so I kind of refocused and said, well, I'll continue to shoot because I'm, you know, finishing school and yeah. bartending and do things. But I, I really want to start working on music. So then I started working with, I happen to know a lot of people in the music industry. So I started recording songs and I recorded like one song with my friend Nosmo, who was this EDM artist. And then uh, we released it at Winter Music Conference. And we then we then we I just started recording more songs and then uh, a friend of mine who, you know, was an A&R guy for uh, Columbia Records, I just happened to be partying with him with like a metal band he was recording in L.A., heard me sing and then was like, let's let's connect you with this one producer out in New York. What? So, yeah, he needed an album. He needed he had an electronic album that he had already written and he needed somebody to write vocals to it to fulfill a publishing deal. So... He connected us. I got recordings of what he had done. And uh, then I booked a flight and I went out to New York and I started writing with him. And we decided after like a week, we were like, okay, this is a good move. Let's do this. So I moved out to New York for six weeks. And I sublet in an apartment and we worked on music and we wrote, we're writing an album. And, um, and then I was working like part time at an Urban Outfitters, like in New York City. What? And living in like this railroad style apartment in alphabet city 
with some random like Australian guy that I had never met before. <laughs> I mean, I just was like went for it and moved out to New York and we wrote and wrote and then I was like, all right, I need to go back to Chicago, go make some money and we need to think on this for a little bit yeah. to finish out the project. And I went back um, to Chicago and then I moved back to New York in 2000 in June. Wow. But by the time I got there, it, he, his had mind had changed about a lot of things. We went through a lot. That was a, it was a hard time in, in, in music. And it was, it, you know, we were going through a lot of transitions in the music industry too, mm -hmm. because like EDM wasn't a thing. Like the closest thing when people would be like, well, what's the music that you're writing? I'm like, it's kind of like Dido. I mean, it was like, the, yeah. how do you explain it? Because nobody was doing it. Moby had just come out. And so um, he had transitioned, was doing some other stuff. So when I got there, he decided kind of like, I don't know if we're going to finish this. Let's put it on hold. And I was just in New York for a while. And then September 11th happened. Oh, you were. Wow. So you were in New, New York? York. Yeah. I lived in Williamsburg and I was working. I was managing a restaurant at night in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, September 11th happened. Jeez. And, you know. It was, it was a crazy day. I woke up. I, was, I wasn't like in a fight with my roommate, who's an old friend of mine. But she walks into my room and she's like, I know you're not speaking to me, but the world's about to end, so you might want to get up. <laughs> oh, my God. And I had the day off. So I, I got up. It was a Tuesday or a Monday from what I remember. It was like a Tuesday. And came out and like September 11th was just going on from yeah. our TV screen. So I stayed in New York for another four or five more weeks after September 11th. But I wasn't having a whole lot of action happening with yeah. the album that we were writing. And I just kind of reprioritized and was like, I want to move back to Chicago. What was the climate like? Because you were there then. I don't, I haven't really talked to anybody that was in New York, you know, days after it, it happened. Like how, how strange was it out there? Uh, it was the strangest time of my entire life up until probably COVID. Yeah. Uh, the, the most traumatic part of it, I think, was the presence afterwards and how it affected the whole population of people. You know, when I would walk from, I would take the train over to Union Square and then I would switch trains and then, you know, and I would, you know, the days after, you know, I had, I was kicked off trains twice by SWAT teams just because they would have all these threats that were coming in constantly. And then you get off the train and you're walking down, you're walking up north. I was walking up to like 45th Street and there would be just walls plastered with pictures every single block of like thousands of people that were just missing. Oh God. And the emotional impact of that and then having all the army vehicles and like the Hummers just parked in the streets and there was just a cloud of dust that just still hung over the city. I think it just really started affecting people's psyche to feel so vulnerable. Yeah. It was just, you know, you're in this city that seems so, un you know, unvulnerable and then you're suddenly struck with the vulnerability of every single person. I wrote a song about it. And in, in that song, one of the, you know, it's called no name. Cause it's about like, I had no name in New York. I was nobody in New York, but yeah. part of it reflected on one day I was walking down second Avenue and it was late at night. I'd like closed the restaurant. I was walking cause I would a lot of times just walk to like union square and then take the train. And there was this guy who was like with a briefcase dressed in a suit sitting outside this bar and he was just crying and people are just walking by wow. and kind of ignoring him. Cause it's, you know, that's a New York thing. Just like there's bums and crazy people everywhere, but I could tell he wasn't a bum I and mean, he wasn't like a crazy person. He was just some 25 year old dude who was just clearly upset about something. Wow. So being the Midwestern girl that I am, I stopped <laughs> and was like, Hey, are you okay? Oh. And his response is, and I was like, no, I, and he was like, no, I'm fine. And I'm like, no, 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 seriously, like, clearly you're not okay. Is, what's going on? And he's like, I'm fine. My family's okay. I'm okay. No one I know died. I'm just sad. Wow. Yeah, that was, God, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine just being, being right at the hub when it happened because it was weird everywhere. I had a gig that night. 
You know, I was telling you, oh, I did wow. the, I, I was still kind of just trying to make my way in Chicago and I was doing like Mondays and Tuesdays or whatever at the Drake Hotel and the piano lounge there. Yeah. And I I called and said, I'm assuming I'm not playing. And they, they said, you have to because no one's going anywhere. These yeah. people are basically trapped in this. Oh, that's what I dealt with for weeks after yeah. in New York because you couldn't leave. Right. And it's already hard to leave New York. I, I always joke that it was like it was an impossible mission to go and get out of New York City. <laughs> you like, had to like find a train and there were cars. You're and like there was Kurt no, Russell in the like old no Escape easy, from New York. Yeah, there's no easy way to get out of New York. <laughs> and uh, but for the weeks after New, uh, after September 11th, the I worked in a restaurant that had a lot of hotels around, and we had regulars that were just tourists who were trapped. You know, people who lived in yeah. London and they couldn't fly back because there were no flights out. Um, the first time they, about two weeks after, I feel like it was when they finally opened up the trains. Mm -hmm. And then I put my roommate who wanted to move back to Chicago. I was like, get on a train and go back. I'll deal with everything here. And to get out of New York and move back, I actually, we abandoned everything in the apartment. Really? Yeah. We, interestingly, like we didn't have a we didn't sign our lease on this apartment ever in Williamsburg. <laughs> the guy had been like after my roommate forever. And then we just abandoned everything. Oh, and I like look back and be like, I wonder if he thought that like we died or just, just what happened to us. If he's a podcast <laughs> listener, he's going to be like, nah, I found her. Those two girls. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, I, I was able to rent a car, packed everything I could get in the car and then drove back to Chicago. Wow. Because, I couldn't, you couldn't get flights, you couldn't get, yeah. and then I needed to get a bunch of stuff back. So it was just a, I look at it, COVID's different right. than, um, than the than whole September 11th event. But, you know, we, we, there was a lot more going on in New York than people know was going on is what I, my biggest reflection. And, you know, that poor city has gone through so much, so many different times, and I just have so much respect for it. Yeah, man, I could, couldn't imagine. I did one of those USO tours and ended up in Sarajevo, I guess. And where's Sarajevo? Out in, out in Bosnia. So it was oh, like okay. it was like traveling. Sorry, I'm to, <laughs> it was like <laughs> she's like, listen, my job is to tell you where the buffet table <laughs> is with relation to table number twenty-five. All right, <laughs> not where Sarajevo. <laughs> is. Get that map away from me. <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, I, I so I had to fly out there and and do I was performing for the troops and stuff and mm -hmm. you're on the bus and you're driving through homes and buildings and it just I always say it looked like Saving Private Ryan like you know wow okay a missile went through mm -hmm. that and like it was just so surreal but I remember thinking oh man I'm so that's glad that's never been brought to our home turf but and then was. New York happens and it's just like oh my god. It was, yeah, that's messed up, man. It was, it was literally like a massive bomb went off. You know, it's the same kind of mentality. So I, I look back at that experience and it, and it changed me as a person. Yeah. I think all the trauma that we go through in life changes you and, and, and makes you either hopefully a better person and you can learn and adjust from it. But, um, I didn't ever think that we would go through anything as traumatic as that in I, my um, lifetime. That night, I remember performing at the piano bar, and, and there were people there, but every everything was just down. Nobody wanted anything. I didn't want to sing. I don't think they wanted, you know, it, it was just like we were all zombies. And there was one table, like, laughing it up, having a blast, and I couldn't understand it. And then I passed by that table on my break, and they were foreigners that couldn't speak any English so couldn't even understand they the news. Know what was going on, they didn't really. know what was going on. Yeah, for they them, were watching the news. They probably thought Chicago is like a downer town. <laughs> like they had no <laughs> idea. From the, you know, so it must have been like a wake up call. Whenever they like got to news, they could actually understand. So they didn't yeah. know. Well, and then know? you came back. I came back to Chicago, and it was just, it was. I mean, New York was bad, but like Chicago was still depressing. Yeah, I couldn't. There was no jobs. I worked in hospitality because I'm a creative person. That's oh, what you now do. Now are we walking to how That's you? That's how I kind of got into look catering. at you. Segway. Get your own show already. This is nice. <laughs> I'm just helping you out. Well done. Uh, the it, but there were no jobs here, and I had been a restaurant manager in New York. Okay. Not a great restaurant manager, but I was, you know, I was doing it <laughs> and I was getting paid. And uh, when I got back to Chicago, there was, I couldn't even pick up like a cocktail waitressing job, really? but I finally did get one. I happened to have worked, you know, in my rave days, one of my 
I helped promote this club in Chicago. It was called Red Dog. And um, my ex-boyfriend was like the promoter for it. And so I knew all the, the owners of that place really well. Uh-huh. So I went to them and was like, can you even give me a shift doing something? And they gave me a cocktail waitressing job on Saturdays and Sundays. And then, um, and then it transferred into some day sh- bartending shifts. And then I started working over at their other venue. I worked at Borderline, which was one of the other places. And then I went to Green Dolphin Street, which was a jazz club in Chicago and restaurant, and started bartending there. And so I really got immersed. I went back to school, finished my degree, and really got immersed. What did you study? I, st- I went to Columbia. Originally, I went to Columbia College in Chicago for photography. Mm-hmm. But then I left to do all these musical adventures yeah. and photography adventures. And then um, I went back, and I graduated with an arts management degree. Because I knew that I liked being in the arts world, but I didn't know what I wanted to do within it. Arts management, would that be kind of like being it, a business manager for an artist? Yeah, kind of thing, like or? business basically for the arts industry, which is basically what I do. But that, yeah. That's that, basically what I do. Boy, that business side of that, that's mm-hmm. Best so class helpful. I ever took was accounting. Yeah. Accounting and accounting too. Love <laughs> them. I, I was able to start a business because I understood accounting. Yeah. I mean, those are, these are the fundamentals that people don't realize, but... I bartended and waited tables, went back to school. I worked on music. I had like this trip hop band for a little while. It was fun. But um, but essentially, I kind of got immersed into hospitality because of being a creative person, which so many people do. I mean, that's so common that people really? are. Really? This I didn't know. Oh, you didn't realize that like, I mean, people who are musicians or artists or photographers, or lots of people pick up hospitality chefs because... It's flexible. You know, even if you're a model, you're an actor, like people work as servers and bartenders because it has flexible hours so you can do your passion on the side and be able to work the shifts that you want to work versus having the nine to five. Oh, yeah. So I guess I realized the, the wait staff version of it. But somebody that ends up where you are, that that's what I didn't didn't realize. Oh, that yeah. I've to done, your level. I've done every job in the hospitality. I have bust. I have served. I have bartended. I have banquet managed. I have. Yeah. I mean, I haven't. I've delivery driven. I've dr- I delivered pizzas one year. <laughs> That's um, huge. I've done everything. I love this story, for- man. I love this story. You know, rock star and then photographer and pizza delivery person. <laughs> like this is awesome. That's well, you as hustle. all involved as it gets. You know, <laughs> seriously, that is awesome. Well, I believe very strongly that the reason why I'm at where I'm at today is because of having a varied experience throughout my whole life yeah. and seeing all the different portions of the hospitality industry and that's really important i think for event planning because you know this is teamwork when we go into events yeah which people don't a lot of people don't realize like i need you as the band leader just as much as i need the banquet captain and i need the photographer all to be on the same page and for us all to work together it really is a military strike. Yeah. In every but but hold on I, but i still want to hear the we'll journey the start. because first off what's awesome Props to you because you definitely sound like somebody who never spent a year on the couch. I mean, it just sounds like you were <laughs> on <laughs> the freaking move, no matter what. At any level, you were a mover and a shaker, which is, that's awesome. That's commendable. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so then, where does it go? You have the degree. You've done all these jobs. And I moved, my ex-boyfriend was a, a en- recording engineer. Okay. And a uh, musician, and he got burnt out in the music industry. In Chicago, and he's like, "Let's move to Colorado." And I was like, "Okay, let's move to Boulder." I graduated. Uh, this story t- goes to Boulder. I moved to Boulder, Colorado, and I thought at that time I'd been doing all these yoga trainings and all this like nurturing and healing and Thai yoga therapy trainings and stuff. I thought I was going to go to Boulder, Colorado, and get out of hospitality, and I was going to be uh, like a personal. I was a certified personal trainer. I was going to be like a healer. Of course, like, you were Did- right. <laughs> I've done everything in life. <laughs> so I was going to do all this stuff. And I get out to Boulder. The problem is I get to Boulder, Colorado. And everybody's like a triathlete in Boulder, <laughs> Colorado. Really? So Seriously? Think about it. Like, I'm like <laughs> wanting to like help like ah, middle-aged women like lose weight and like get fit and like <laughs> find inner peace. And everybody's already like... <laughs> 
like hiking mountains <laughs> every knew? day. And well, I was sitting there going, oh, like, well, this is not a good plan. <laughs> this is a bad plan. That's awesome. So huh. I take a job bartending sure. at a chop house. And then I get a job in, Col- in Boulder at this really, really terrible hotel. Okay. As a catering manager. And so I... So right off the bat, I know enough about catering managers. Like right off the bat, you're in charge of, you know, either a big or a small army. Right off the bat. that that there, yeah. There's your first introduction into... I mean, there's a lot that goes into being a catering manager. So yeah, right off I the mean, bat. Catering the catering managers for an event are essentially yeah. your your okay, catering in in the venue are fifty percent of your event. Yeah. Fifty you know, percent of your budget typically. They're they're managing the largest part of the event as far as setup venue, food and beverage service. So it's a significant part of event planning. What was that um explosion of you know that's that's a still a, diff, a different education. You know, so, uh, albeit you know it's 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 a nice lateral step, but also step forward from what you were doing. You know, you had a sense of that being a manager at different places. Restaurants and but I mean, what banquets, are you picking yeah. up? Like, what is the big? You know, like you know, I don't know. I was doing. I was a very yeah. successful club singer for many years, and then when I got into the fancy events, that first year, the first two years, it was this tidal wave of oh wait, oh this is different. Okay, they're <laughs> <laughs> These are strict timelines, and there's this, and there's that. Yeah. You know, so how how did that work when you first walk into the catering? Well, luckily, it was a really terrible hotel, so, <laughs> so it's they, just, <laughs> it was like it was just a shit show. You fixed them. I walked in, and I was like, at least I had a background, having worked. I had worked in a magazine for, yeah. as a business manager, doing events and helping plan events through that. I had, you know, worked for oh. a restaurant in Midtown Manhattan. So I like I had structure as far as hospitality. I didn't know anything about catering at all mm-hmm. other than having been like worked banquets at like Green Dolphin Street. I've been like a, a bartender, you know, on a wedding. But I I they kind of threw me in the mix and nobody kind of knew what they were doing there. It was such a it was such a poorly run place. The place isn't even there anymore. Yeah. It's like it was torn down and like put up condos or something like that. <laughs> But, um, but it was interesting because it was an open, it was open to me figuring it out. Oh, you had a, bl- a little bit of a blank canvas there? Yeah. And okay. I had the ability, the freedom to learn under fire, you know, just go through it and figure it out as you go. And, um, I screwed up so much and I had made so many mistakes looking back on it and they made so many mistakes looking yeah. back on it, but you have to have something that opens up a doorway. And I didn't think that I would necessarily stay in that field, but I moved back to Chicago a year later. How long had you? Okay. A year I was, later. I was okay. there for a year, a little over a year. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, with my ex-boyfriend anymore. And I just, I, re- I realized that this is my comment. He was like, I was like, you want to live up in the mountains and be like a mountain man. And I really want to like go put on my heels and be cosmopolitan. So I'm just not <laughs> gelling with this whole world of Patagonia. It didn't play out like a rom-com <laughs> at all. That's no, yeah. It wasn't the place for me. Uh-huh. It was a little too uh, granola as I okay. said. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's like I'm an urban girl. And I, uh, too granola, <laughs> a little too granola for me. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so I moved back to Chicago and I had just been in a catering manager position. They actually promoted me to director of catering, which was like the most ridiculous thing in Chicago. No, or, oh, back at, there at that place yeah. after like six months, they were like, you should be the director of catering. Cause you know what you're doing. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but sure. I'll take the pay increase. <laughs> And I came back to Chicago and I took jobs in catering. So I worked at various different hotels and then I got a job what was, offer. What, what, when, you first, when you first jumped back in, what, yeah. were you, what was like the first position you were able to grab coming in? I was a catering manager at the Hilton Northbrook. Okay. Which is a nice hotel that does a lot of social events in the suburbs. There's a lot of bar and bat mitzvahs yep. and like, you know, kind of suburban level weddings. And I got really great training there. Um, I have to say Holly Algauer, who whose family owns it, and she was she was a great catering director because she was a stickler for details. Mm-hmm. And they were, and Monica, who was my associate catering director, she they really trained me on one well, the sales process, but they also really learned how to detail out things ve- really really specific. 
And then I took You're that You're talking with about me. timelines and such or Just in catering, you have to be really specific. There's a huge communication from from the salesperson or the event manager to the rest of the staff in the hotel. Yeah. And there's a whole process that people are completely unaware of. You know, we have a wedding coming up that we're working on together. Yeah. And you know, you do I, I relay really detailed information to those venues. And then they, in turn, turn that into more communication within, like, say, the hotel or mm-hmm. property. So, you know, learning that as a base early on and how to be restructured. I mean, I had some basic level information from Boulder, but coming here, they were a really great base to start and learn. And then I went to the Double Tree Oak Brook, which is across the street from, like, McDonald's. And I did all their social catering there. And then I was hired to open up the Intercontinental O'Hare, which is now a Lowe's hotel. But when it opened, I was there 15 months prior to opening. I was the third employee. Wow. It was a really interesting experience because we had a slab of concrete. That was it. And I had renderings of what the ballroom was supposed to look like. And that's it. And I was told, here, develop a food and beverage sales approach for social catering. Uh, Figure out how we're going to do as many events as possible. We ended up having four 8,000 square foot ballrooms. So we could do four 300 person weddings at the same time. And then are they like selling um, events before, you know, I was paints selling, drying? Oh even? yeah. I yeah. sold like a million dollars in catering before we even could do like a site tour, a real site tour. What's the plan there? Are, are people, are people kind of coming to the, you know, they, they're, they're getting suggestions that they obviously Hilton's a name people know. Oh, it was or, Intercontin- oh yeah. Or it was the, intercontinental. The new one was intercontinental. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting mixed up. So then were you, are you going out doing any chasing at that point? Are there events that you're doing or like, are, are you going out for clients or because of the name intercontinental or people kind of coming even before, you know, the walls are all up? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's an advertising marketing strategy that you have with the okay. opening or with any kind of venue. But uh, essentially, people are coming to you asking for information okay. versus me having to really outside sales quite a bit. It was a lot of inside sales. People are directing them to saying, I want to check out this new hotel. And it was a beautiful property. Sales is interesting because I would imagine there's a whole marketing department that's in charge of getting the deal. But then... If you're a person in that position, kind of running that room, then you're in charge sometimes of the last percent, uh, last ten percent of closing the deal. You know, there are times. You know, yeah. you know what I mean. Like there are times where, like, the booking person from my office uh, is asking me to talk to a, a, a bride and groom or somebody mm-hmm. right before they sign the contract. They want to feel me out, and it, and basically, I end up giving a sales pitch. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing the last ten percent of the selling job, you know. And I to imagine give them that security. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Where I imagine that's kind of what you're doing too back then, anyway. When you're showing a room, or when you're, you know. Well, we ha- we cooked and booked. So what it means by booking and cooking, or whatever. I've never heard it. Was, it was we call booking and cooking. That means that you would book the business and then you carried that client all the way through to the end which leads very much to the event planning yes i can't wait to talk about that because that's huge (laughs) that's huge yeah oh man you guys are going to learn so much and then you're also going to learn like you 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 might even be better off at planning your own wedding if you haven't yet by the end of this because we're also going to get into (laughs) some stories on that i'm going to take the quick eye blink are you good with that yeah let's do it. all right quick eye blink for you guys we'll be right back in a sec Boom, we're back. So there it is. A, an eye blink for you guys in like 15 minutes for us to... I put happy juice in my coffee. Mm-hmm. So for us to just make a cocktail. And you know what? And I wanted a cocktail before we really get into what could translate into some funny stories. <laughs> but wait, I want to keep building though. Okay, so here you are. You're doing the hotel thing. Obviously, so much mm-hmm. goes into that. You're, you know, it's a major property. And how many, wait, how many event like rooms? 550 ro- hotel rooms, and there were four 8,000 square foot ballrooms. And you now. said that's the one that's by O'Hare? Yeah, it's now the Lowe's O'Hare. But, yeah. like, I named the ballrooms. Really? Like, it was a really important part of my career because I was there so early and so much a part of that building of that company. And, even leaving it was painful, you know, because it was, it was like a part of my life. I lived there. I felt like. Did you leave it to jump into another similar job or was that the leap into 
Megan Estrada oh, as no. a product, as a brand. No, it was, I, I had various different disappointments. I mean, I had given my life for that hotel. Sure. Which, looking back, I'm like, why would I ever give my life for somebody else's business that way? That is tricky, though, but we all, we all do that sometimes. We all do it, and that that's, you know, and we'll get probably into the COVID thing, where the COVID thing even kind of lets you know, like, oh, wow, where should all my chips always be over mm-hmm. here, or 80% of my chips and stuff, but... How can you help it? I think it helps, too, when you have a machine behind you. You had a machine. We had a machine. We you know? opened. We killed it. Yeah. I was doing extremely well in catering. I had a great team. I loved the girls who worked with me. They were just, like, really smart women. Yeah. I really respected um, everybody that we had hired on the company. And um, I was just really integrated into that hotel. So I, you know, and I was there on the weekends. Because I was doing all these events. I mean, right. I booked all this business going in and then continued to book. So your ground, like the ground, my God, your day must, like for a major event, your day must start. Oh, it started like I would be there at 8 a.m., but then I'd be leaving at 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. Whenever basically the food, once the once the food's done and yeah. the dancing starts, I can leave. And it's still the same way now for event planning. Like, I leave my assistants. They can close. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to be there all day. But I... I was, you know, but I was the, I was the director of catering that was there, like walking through the whole property and I got to know everybody Yeah, and I really felt connected to the, all the staff and, and that's part of my, how I really developed my company too, of feeling like I, you know, I'm loved and feared. Yeah. <laughs> I was loved and feared in catering, but I also feel that kind of way about event planning. Like it's important. a lot of people, when I they first meet me or a lot of people who work with me, sometimes they're like a little scared of me because I can be a little intense. Um, but I'm really also very detail oriented and it can be a little frightening, but I was loved and feared in a really healthy way. Mm-hmm. And then I just, I, I felt like that's where I learned that camaraderie of the different teams yeah, and how everybody like in a hotel, everybody's important to make, get the job done. And in events, it's the same thing. Like you, I respect the housekeeper who cleans the room. And as much as I respect the banquet director, who's running the banquets department, we all have to play our part. And it's the same thing for events. We all have to play our part and we all need to be respected in our positions. So I, I love that, by the way, there's a lot in many industries yeah. where, you know, the top tier position just pays attention to the top tier position. Yeah. And all of a sudden the foot soldiers aren't getting the love. And I've seen that and it always disappoints me. But that's me. how you win the war. It's exactly. And they're, and, and, and they're the ones still holding up the foundation of everything. And, oh, and yeah. yeah, and it, it just that, that that always disappoints me when I see that. Well, if the know. foundation cracks, which is those are all those those. The, the, the you would call the bottom level positions, but right. I think that those the support positions, they those support positions are who makes all the above positions able to climb higher. Yeah, and it's like yeah, like you think about we're all going to war on each one of these events. We go to war, and we all have to take care of each other. And nobody can be falling backwards. You have to go and like be able to carry everyone through. And I look at it that way, you know, yeah. even if in the entertainment industry is a lot, very much the same, like the music industry, you know, the band's only as good as their crew, mm-hmm. you know, if their crew doesn't show up and do the right job and they can, and screws up the mixing of the monitors, it really, doesn't it ma- screws up everything for everyone. It doesn't matter how good you are all of a sudden. Yeah, it's true. So, so I was doing that and then I actually left because, um, I, it's a long story, but it kind of played into the Me Too movement. Yeah. Of like, oh, I, really? Were you feeling... Well, it wasn't at that time that it was... It wasn't Me Too at that time. This was 2008, 2009. But young, attractive girl in this well, position, did that no, it bring out that. some problems or what? It wasn't that. It was more so me addressing other people's problems. So we had these cocktail waitresses who were really... Um, they were They were given a uniform that I think was inappropriate for a hotel cocktail waitress in a club. Because wow. they have like this club, this jazz club, which my friend actually booked all the talent out of it. I uh-huh. brought him in. Like I was really ingrained in the hotel. And I would hear the cocktail waitresses complaining about this uniform all the time because it was like just it was just not appropriate and for service. 
And they would wear all these different things to cover up parts of their body to prevent them from being harassed or looked at or objectified by the male. They had to cover up their own freaking uniform. Yeah. Because, you know, or yeah. put under stuff underneath and things like that. Yeah. They would complain about it. So I finally brought it. We had a new HR director who I didn't know as well as the previous one. And I brought it to her attention. I was like, you know, I'm hearing these complaints. Like, you, you guys might want to look into it. She's like, did you bring it up to the other director, like their their male like food and beverage director? And I was like, no, of course I didn't bring it up to. And I'm not going to bring it up to like the general manager who designed the outfit. Right. I'm not going to bring it up to. I'm bringing it up to HR. Like here, between you and me, they're yeah. not feeling so comfortable. I hear it. I'm here on the weekends. So they looked into it and they said, don't talk to anybody about it. And I'm like, okay. But I happen to run into one of the cocktail waitresses in the restroom one day when she's trying to like pin and redirect this whole yeah. uniform. And I'm like, Hey, if you really don't like this, go tell HR. But like, it's an interesting time period because you got to think of in 2009, um, we were just post recession. Mm-hmm. We we're like in the recession. We, um, you know, as a cocktail waitress in a hotel, you get benefits and you have a secure job. And for some of these girls, like that was great to have health care. You know, you got to remember health care before uh, the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. You know, I, I went through that even um, I went through that in different points in my life. Like health care was hard to get. And so if you could get a job full time, even if you're not making the greatest wages, but you have health care and you're going to school also part time or full time and working like that's a great deal. So. You know, we were in a recession. These girls had health care. Oh, no. They so, were afraid uh, to make waves. They were uh, totally afraid to oh, say anything. Shit. So I was speaking up because I thought I'm like, you know, I'm like this top director of catering. I can like speak up for these women and put yeah. a voice in. Well, sh- I tell her, you know, you should bring it up. You know, I, I, I've mentioned it to them before. I think that you should bring it up and your concerns. So like two weeks later, they bring me in the office the HR office. And I knew something was up when they called me down to HR and the general manager's there, the associate general manager's there and the HR director. And they put this piece of paper in front of me and say, we asked you not to go and speak to anybody about this matter. And we heard from one of the cocktail waitresses that you spoke to her about it. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, didn't you, did you talk to all the cocktail waitresses? Yes, they're all fine with the uniform. Oh, my God. And I'm like, of course they're going to tell that. They don't want to lose their job. Oh, I mean, that's like, terrible. Let's, let's be realistic here, right? Ugh. So they put this, and they wanted me to basically sign off that I had done something wrong. And I was like, I am the model employee. I'm looking out for the employees, like, as a director. And I was like, how dare you ask me to sign off that I've done something wrong. So somehow they're using that to maybe cover their ass later in life. Or I have something. no there idea. Must be some, there must be some kind of safety. Mm-hmm. They were putting something in place so that, it, you know, a little bit of a hush on the... But they knew they were doing something wrong. They knew that there, there was something possibly inappropriate, but right. they didn't want to change anything. Yeah. And I was so insulted by the idea that they would... Wow would not respect me and my looking out for the staff. And I mean, the general manager and I had history going back. That was not, I was not happy with him prior. Sure. But, but the fact that they treated me like that and they were treating the employees like that. So they put the piece of paper in front of me and instead I took off my name tag. I put it down on the table and I said, I cannot work for a hotel to treat people Just like, like this. that. And I walked out and I quit. Yeah. My like director like, of like, catering opened like one a of hotel those job. Action cop <laughs> movies like, with was. the badge and the gun on the desk. <laughs> I'm out of here. It really was. Whoa. It was really dramatic. I yeah. can't believe that I did it. So then I like walked out. <laughs> I was like banned from the hotel. I, they oh wouldn't let me God. go back for six months or something they're like you cannot come back on property i'm like are you kidding me (sighs) i built this hotel see the movie version of this all all the the (laughs) way the servers and stuff they they stand up and they start clapping while you're walking out and there's a moment no it's more like i just like went they just like keep your heads down don't talk to her (laughs) (laughs) we gotta keep our insurance i went to like collect my like Uh, from my office like a piece of artwork and they were like are you sure it's yours i was like oh my god you gotta be kidding me like i do you think that the hotel supplied this piece of artwork that's been sitting in my office just picking the scab oh, but that's scab. cool that you took a stand during yeah. a time where 
it wasn't very um it, it was harder to do back then there wasn't a support system for that kind of talk no and then know? when the me too movement ca- like kind of came out it's really struck a chord with me because i had seen that happening and like there's the complications of why people put up with whatever abuse they're dealing with mm-hmm. in a workplace whether it's emotional physical abuse or or a you know or sexual abuse or anything like that. Yeah. You know, it's much more complicated than people. It's not surface level. It, it has to do with the, all these different levels of like, I mean, I, I joke at times, like I got married because of health insurance. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like, a lot of people do. Lot, like I didn't, I didn't think of it that way at that time. But when I look back on it on different times in my life, there's so many layers to weigh and, and how public policy yeah. affects it. And that's why I really care about being involved in politics or being care about being involved in, and in changing. It you sucks know, for anybody to have to be in that position, you know, like for, for instance, you know, the folks who have having to wear like scantily clad uniforms and just not to make the waves, you know, it, it just, it just sucks. You know, I, I see it. I've, I go through it where I, yeah. you have to, you know, I mean, nobody's doing that to me or, you know, I'm not like, you know, Oh no, why is this man nipple out there in the <laughs> wedding? You know, I'm like, I want to cover these. That, that doesn't happen. But I do find myself, you know, having to pick and choose battles when maybe I wish I could make every battle, you know, yeah, but no. sometimes you just have to find out what's going to be safe and what, you know, it, that, it's a whole thing, man. You have to navigate your own path and, know who you are and how you're going to navigate it. I, I think that's one of the reasons why I feel, I felt so passionately about starting my own company. So I, was it right on the heels of that or what did you do first? No, I, I left catering for a little while. I was going to get my MBA. I was taking my GMATs. And, um, see the movie version, you'd be outside the event center with like a bag with booze in it and just screaming, you're nothing without me, (laughs) you know, in the movie version. And then no, you have to actually, clean yourself well, up and get back really into it. It was really crazy the next day. Yeah. The next day, they the hotel filed for bankruptcy. What? Yeah. So it was a new hotel. It had just opened. It was open like a year and a half. And then, like, I worked for them for two years or whatever it was. And I like filed. that you, you got a little quiet for that part as if maybe they're listening. Well, I think that's the dog barking <laughs> in the background. I'm like, somebody in my house? Um, the, but... They yeah. filed for bankruptcy the next day. And oh, wow. So then you got to think about this. I had just left and everybody starts calling me who we had debts on. Right. So I had like a kosher caterer was calling me. We had just done a kosher wedding. We owed them all this money for the kosher catering and the linen company and all these different vendors that I had brought into the hotel. And they called me and were like, what's going on with the bankruptcy? And I'm like. I mean, I had known that they had were having financial problems. It was a recession. We had opened up like a two hundred and twenty million dollar hotel or something like right. that. It was just, it was stupid the whole circumstances. But it looked from everyone in the industry's perception, it looked like I had left because <laughs> they had filed bankruptcy, uh, and I was like, oh no, but that could be played into it. So I just rolled with that because no, at that time, like being like. I left because of morals. Nobody would have accepted. Oh, you should have like, flipped what? it. You should. You should have said, you know, "No, no, no!" But they're going bankrupt because I left. <laughs> you should have ran with that story. <laughs> that yeah. would have been a good. They story. tanked because they didn't they have the Megan. Because they didn't have me. Bam. Um, so then, what do you do then? So then, I was getting my MBA. I started bartending for a little while, and then I got a job working for Thompson Hotels. Um, and I met my ex-husband, and so I got was that- married. Still along the lines of like the catering or the yeah, I was working as a catering director okay. for this hotel in Chicago. So then you're bouncing Kansas. around a bit. When when does boom? When does the light bulb moment happen where you're like, okay? So I worked for Thompson Hotels for two years, and I was pregnant with my son like the day I walked into the job. Okay. Oh my gosh! And it was just a it was a bad situation, but I um. But I, I basically, I got, I met my ex-husband, moved in with him, was pregnant, engaged, had my son and got married all within one year. <laughs> and I was working for this hotel. You're and efficient. then, <laughs> yeah, really efficient. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, three months after, um, what was it? Four, no, four months after I had my son, I was pregnant with my daughter. 
So the moment I realized I was pregnant with my daughter, I was like, I can continue to be a catering director and take the train downtown every day and continue to work for somebody else. Or I can change my whole lifestyle and change my focus and I can do event planning. I was like, mm -hmm. I am so well versed in this. I know this market. I know everybody. I can do this. Did you have friends? Uh, did, had you befriended event planners at this point too? To I just... didn't really, actually I didn't work with that many event planners at the venues that I was at where we had relationships in that level. Um, but I had done, you know, coordination of different weddings outside of the hotel that I worked for along yeah. with handling so much on site that I was like, you know, I can do some month of coordinations for my clients. I can bring, I can bring that to the community that I'm living in, in the North shore. Cause there really wasn't anybody based up here and it's a really affluent community that does a lot of nice events. So what are your first like five moves or whatever? What are your first yeah. moves? So the, the day that you decide, okay, this is it. I created a website. I created product like my process. You came up with the with the name stuff. right away. I knew that I wanted it to be North Shore Weddings and Events because um, I was I'm from the North Shore and mm -hmm. I wanted a brand that was connecting with the community that I wanted to sell to. So one of the things I always say is like if you want to, you know, you have to identify who your client is and then sell to that client. Don't just like throw random marketing out there you know, really identify who your client is and then go after them. So I knew that I wanted that North Shore clientele. I knew that there weren't a lot of planners who were in the, you know, new district that I grew up in of the North Shore. And I was like, okay, let's just, I'm just going to do this and this will give me flexibility. So by the time I had my daughter was on maternity leave, I had my first wedding client. And then, you know, I left the hotel after that maternity leave and was just like, okay, let's see what happens. Even if I make a little extra cash here and there. Now, and what's kind of cool is when you're doing, you know, there, there are certain venues that, I don't know if I'm, certain venues I'll work with where the catering manager kind of warps into um, an event. Manager. Uh, yeah, the, the event manager. Some of them are very good at it, and some of them are terrible at it yeah. because it's just not what they do. And all of a sudden, they're the event. You know, somebody should get a planner for that. But but anyway, yeah. some are good at it, and and because you were in that world, so you were forced to be a planner probably quite often when yeah. you had that position before. Oh, absolutely. So you already knew the ins and outs. How much? How much was there that you that you didn't know? Though you're like, oh, okay, okay, didn't see this coming. Let me let me work on this or that or this or that. The hardest things for me to learn coming from hotels was not contracts or timing or event management from that point of view because I had already had to do it at a more basic level, not as thorough of a level for the hotels. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, a lot of my clients didn't have wedding planners, so like we had to do a lot of the work for them. I think the the greatest challenges were with offsite catering because I didn't know offsite catering. I had to learn that, and I had to learn how that works, which is different. I had to learn how to how, tenting and equipment. Luckily, I I partnered up with some really great vendors who were supportive, and 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 we worked together to, for me to learn more and more, mm -hmm. and then. Also, the event design process, like the amount that I have learned about event design over the last, you know, 10 years. Has that been, term event design. Like, like from floral to decor to the, I thought I knew some things when I was working in catering, but like I have learned so much more from being hands on working with these different vendors. And like, I think that it's a natural evolution because you, for, for me, I started to kind of taking on the event management side of people who had a lot of things already booked and I'm just being... I'm just managing it for the month yeah. of coordination. And then it just started growing into full planning. And um, I had a sustainable company. But then about three years, it was a sustainable company where I was, I was actually I was shocked. I was making as much money as I was and I was having as many events as I was. But it, clearly I was like, something's working here with the yeah. way I'm modeling my business. And then I just constantly keep evolving it, you know, and just kept figuring out like, what is the market looking for? How can I better my processes? How can I better my approach? And when I first came in, you know, you're very controlling. And I think that that's, I've become less controlling about the, about my weddings as I've gotten older, because as you expose to more things, you're like, it's all going to work out. You know, it's just, you have to like, you have to be really detailed and then you have to step back and let the managed chaos happen. 
Well, even even with staffing too, right? Because I think yeah. you 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 learn when you get get somebody who can do something. You know, I think I was forced. The first version of the 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 final say band that had a female vocalist in it. Yeah, she was so super talented, Allison Arobia, like yeah. an amazing talent. Hated talking on the mic. So totally let me know, like, I will never talk on this thing. <laughs> you're like, that's you know, your you're, job. You're good at this anyway. <laughs> it's always going to be you all the time. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing that for six years. And then we get the new girl, Morgan Hare, who joined geez, four or six years ago. Six years ago. I've worked with you both with both of them. I remember right. Too. Yes. So Morgan is better at speaking to the crowd and wants to speak to the crowd, mm-hmm. you know. But at first... I, I don't know this. I'm just, at this point, my life had been threatened by Alice and Arobia. <laughs> like never, <laughs> like never they never put me on the There was one cor- like co- corporate conference with all the bands and the owners of the company, and they were talking more about, you know, yeah, we, I mean, we'd really like participation by both singers as well, like really engage up there. We want, we'd like to know that you're both <laughs> talking. And, and Allison like looked to me during that meeting and did like the, the finger across the throat <laughs> sign, like, I will kill you, you, you know? Well, talk. then we cut to Morgan Hare, who's, who's definitely more, more more boisterous and uh, a bigger personality and she's like why aren't you letting me talk huh is there a problem <laughs> am i not allowed to talk so and then it took a while and then i heard her talk and thought okay well that's good but it took a minute to first realize okay she can do this well and then to just oh realize oh oh this is i don't have to do this i don't and then she it was kind of like nice right this, this nice. doesn't have to be a hundred percent of me handling every second of that moment on stage i yeah. can get a drink of water and she can talk for a second, you know, so that whole thing, did that take a minute for you for anything? You know, you start off it trying was, to do everything. But. You start off, it's more so about controlling. I was very controlling when I was a catering director yeah. because it felt like every single aspect of what was happens. So people don't realize this, but like, you know, well planned events are planned in advance, right? Yeah. So you know, when I was a catering director, everything's a reflection of the venue, even in the caterer, even if it's not their responsibility. I talk about this with caterers all the time. I'm like half the problems that caterers have has to do with the client not giving them appropriate information, like the place cards or the escort cards are like bad or wrong or like not well executed yeah. or they don't give them a seating chart or all these different things. And then they're, they're challenged to do the job, but it ends up being a reflection of them. It's not a reflection of the client they're like oh well why was dinner late oh the caterer must be horrible (laughs) it's not the caterer's fault sometimes it's the client's fault because they get really bad information just like the band sometimes like you were talking about a story once about like how that woman was like trying to control your entire set list and nobody wanted to dance right well this ain't your fault yeah and that crowd is thinking like oh this band can't get us going like oh she handcuffed the band she handcuffed the band yeah but then you flip that too, and suddenly the people that are working, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, underneath you, don't always realize that they need to really be on their shit. They need to be very meticulous and good at their job and pay close attention because sometimes they forget that um, sometimes if they falter or make some bad decisions, oftentimes it's on you. You know, you're the one getting yelled at. It. You know what I mean? Well, I don't get yelled at. Yeah. Well, well, you no, know. <laughs> I think a lot of people are scared of yelling. At you me. do have a very strong disposition that helps. <laughs> no you know. one would ever no one would yell, yell at me <laughs> at an event. If they did, they would be scared for their lives most of the time. Happen. I mean, I, as I say, I'm loved and feared. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but like. I, I, I got to toughen up. <laughs> I have too much of a nice demeanor. I think. No, you're so, we've always gotten along. Well, I think like no, cl- no clear. We didn't have to clarify our roles. I, I you think, did your role. I do my role. But I think Don't people probably think like, hey, he's just a nice guy. Like, oh, no. No, I just, you're. I t- want a little more of you, too, though. I want a little to toughen no, up. No, you're good. Yeah. No, you're good. Like, okay. I, we, <laughs> You and I have a good working relationship. We've gone, we've gone through quite a bit. We we've have, done a lot of events that's together. A crazy one, and you know, I can say this now. There was one kind of testy wedding, and I, my hands were tied on that one because we had a sound guy that sucked for well, like two years. That's a great story. The lost power thing. The lost power. That was in Northfield. Yes, we did a wedding in their backyard, and that was not the first wedding I did with you. That was like the second or okay. third wedding, and. I'm at the church. Oh, first of all, we, we couldn't get, we needed, we got like generator power for the tent. Yeah. I tested the generators. They were fine the previous day, but I'm over at the church and some in your sound guy or somebody calls me and is like, one of the generators is down. That's him. And, 
<laughs> or do you have his tone down? <laughs> One of the generators is down. <laughs> I don't know what to do about it or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, shoot. So I'm like about to send the bride and groom down the aisle. And um, I ran out to the crowd. And luckily, the bride's uncle, who I had done his daughter's wedding, was an electrician. So I like ran out to the crowd and was like, hey, do you mind... Like, do you mind like helping us with the power at the wedding? Because like we happen to have some generator problems. So I think I'm gonna have to run power off the house. And luckily like their next door neighbors, also my clients, so maybe we can run power. Wait, off Wait, was house. that when we had like wires we coming had, from the like, different, all different houses? <laughs> Cause they had one like shared backyard. That's and right. so like the groom's about to walk down the aisle uh. and he's like, what's going on? Is everything cool? And I was like, well, I mean, the generator power's out, but I've got an electrician on it. We'll be fine. <laughs> and he's like, what? Is everything going to be okay? I'm like, yeah, it's totally fine. I got an electrician. We'll be fine. <laughs> Just walk down the aisle. It'll be fine. And like the, the wedding was great. And then, but the wedding, if you remember, do you remember the lights? Like the power kept blowing because right. we had to route like the lights off one house. We had to write the power off another yes. house. Because people don't realize that. Like a band pulls. It's a lot of power. A multiple different circuits. And like, these are one of the things that like when I'm putting up a tent or even when I'm in like an old hotel ballroom, they'll yeah. like drop a spider box and we have to measure the power that we need. But when I have a tent, like I have to have power for the lights. I have to have power for the band. And I have to have how many different circuits and they have to produce so much power and it has to be steady power. It can't be pulled. And on the old houses, sometimes you can't pull off old houses because they don't have that power level. So these are like event planning things that I now know really well. But in the beginning stages, like I was still learning because I was used to having like a brand new hotel that had all the power in the world yeah. and multiple circuits to it's pull off. It's such of. a joy for for us when, when we're going to, going to do something that's outside in a tent. And when one of the questions presented to us is how much power What's do you need? What's the power requirement? Yeah, because that's yeah. huge, you know. But that, yeah, that's, but yeah, you've always been kind of Johnny on the spot. I can't totally remember our first encounter though i don't remember well, our first our first wedding together was at armor house in lake forest wow it was a long time ago it was like 2013 that's impressive man good memory i remember everything uh but i i remember it and um and they're great clients i still to this day that bride still has her wedding picture as her instagram picture oh wow like to this day oh that's cool like it's cool and and like that's that's actually what the, the greatest part of my job, I think, is these relationships that I develop with these clients. And I know and I see everything that goes on in their lives continuing yeah. afterwards. It's I take a lot of pride in that. And I can't, you know, I know a lot of people want to keep increasing pricing and they want to have the highest priced clients and the highest priced events. Right. and they less events and more. But I just love all the relationships that I've developed over the years and all these people that I know. I mean, it's just the the client, you know, it's different for like a band or even the florist or anybody like that. They don't get to intimately know these clients as much as I do. Yeah. Where they become my friends. I mean, I have one client. We did the wedding in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And that client, I mean, I've I've known them for years. And now, you know, to me, they're like I've you know, the mother of the, of the brides, you know, the, the mother of the family matriarch is, is she's. I really consider her one of my really good friends. Like I was over at her house a month ago, like drinking wine and eating really? cheese and just hanging out. And it, it's just such a, that is what gives me back on this industry really is that I get to be a part of people's lives and I get to help them. And at the end of the day, they feel that love and response. And then we, I get to just continue to know them. I like the, your, your respect level when, when you know, somebody's, you know, I, I always know that if, if I'm not doing something right, you are going to let me know. <laughs> That's okay. But I no, like it's perfect. But I like that, and I, and I because also then the the re rewards of if you think somebody's good at what they do, you know, I'll never forget. Um, oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting what is his name from the TV show who we both know, um, you know, from the Chicago based. What's the TV show? Uh, uh, oh Lord, it was like a staple, kind of like not cable, but it was a Chicago music show, and you knew the host. Oh, JBTV. JBTV, and that you came to my five year anniversary. I came to your five year, and I was just honored to be invited to the thing. You know, oh my I, gosh, and then we threw it at JBTV, which was so cool. It was great. Right? That was the was coolest different. thing. But I just saw the way you treated people you'd worked with, and and at that event, I just realized like, oh, okay, she's. 
you know, this is you don't see this. Planners don't do this. Well, I, it's know. not about posh and posture. Right. You know, this is at the end of the day. This is about taking care of people. This is what I do is I take care of people. I take care of you guys, the vendors. I take care of the client. And then my job is to go and bring us all together and when make you, sure that we're taken care of. When you came up and even just said hello and you, you we're, we're chatting for a bit at whatever at the at the a, a table for a second, you know, because you you're doing the rounds it on top of everything else. I wasn't talking to somebody that just through the event as if like okay well you're here you got the invite that's good enough like you you really talked like a real oh. person like like an appreciative person you know you still there are still people that might do something like that like what you did for vendors like yeah. me and they would still talk to everyone like they were a number or like they're beneath them yeah yeah which yeah. is it was yeah. the main biggest complaint about planners from working on the vendor side is that I felt like planners treated the vendors like they were not important. I and I was, and, and that's my whole philosophy is that I have to create an environment where the vendors can be successful. That's what we have like different in my company. We have different goals of, and in producing the events. And one of the goals of our company is to create an environment where vendors can be successful. And that's my job is to help them and assist them. And it, like, we're all in this together. We have to respect each other. Yeah. And I can't do this without you. So why, why would I treat you with disrespect? And, and as I've gotten to know people, like when I don't like somebody, I don't work with them. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. <laughs> if I don't like them, I won't work with them. <laughs> and if I really like you, I'm going to keep referring you and working with you because I know that you have that same hospitality mentality. Yeah. And I just think that we have to elevate our mentality about how we treat each other. I think it's just in life. I think that we all should be treating each other better in general. But um, it's funny because you mentioned that anniversary party because I'm coming up on 10 years in 2021. Wow. So that's going to be a big party <laughs> because so we're going to get out of COVID. Yeah, yeah, that is right. We're going right, to right. get, get into phase five <laughs> and I'm inviting everyone. I'm inviting everyone. Huge part of that. But it, that was a great time and that's that's what really, it's hard when you're doing so many events and, and you know, for me, there's this kind of rotating door yeah, I don't. Again, I don't know. I, I, doing two hundred, two hundred three oh shows God, a year. So it, it even rooms after a while when people are like, "Yeah, you know, the Palmer House." Do you I'd remember that stop. event? Yeah, and you're like, like oh. I don't remember. But even remembering the rooms sometimes yeah. until I walk in, I'm like, oh right, okay, that's what this one looks like. You know, they all blend together. But you made such an impression on me. You know, even to the point where you know I always talk about you know whatever I might you you, and you were very complimentary, which was great. You're like you know you 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 you're, you're I like you on the stage. <laughs> yeah. No, you have a good presence about you. Well, that's, that, it's a huge thing. People don't realize this how This is not something event band. planners tell band people, though. I don't need, you know. Oh, well, then that's, that's disappointing because the band, the, when I ask people what their priorities are, which is part of my whole, like, vetting process, like, discussions up front when I'm yeah. planning with them, and say, what are your priorities? And we go through the priorities. And very often, the top priority for a lot of people is the music. Right. Because they recognize that that sets the atmosphere. I say three things make a party. The, the atmosphere, so the event decor, atmosphere, the things you have going on, mm -hmm. the food and beverage, because that's a huge component of like the experience, what you're tasting, eating. These are your senses. So you, what you see, what you are, experience around you, then what you taste in your, in your mouth and the texture and visualizing that whole experience of the food. Yeah. And then the third element to all parties is the entertainment, like it's not a party without an entertainment, even right. if that entertainment is just dinner party and you're having conversation with other people around the table, but you have to cultivate all three of these elements in order to create a great party. Yeah. And so people generally will prioritize the music or the entertainment for their party. And it should be. And, that's why I push people towards, uh, like, I encourage people to have bands, if at all possible. It's interesting because a lot of people also don't recognize the difference between a band and a DJ. Many, right. Right? And, like, when I'm selling it, because, you know, I can, we book lots of DJs, especially in, like, like the whole, like, post-COVID world where people are, like, downsizing and doing smaller weddings. Yes. Like They're like, DJ, that'll be just make more sense. Less people, right? Right. But bands provide a whole new entertainment level that you can't have with a DJ. I grew, I grew up in the EDM world, right? 
And DJs are great because they can play so many different songs and right. it's the true recordings of them. But they're really boring. After a while. Okay, so we used to do rave parties <laughs> and we'd have to put up like laser and light shows yes. and like tons of entertainment. <laughs> Because DJs are boring. Let's be honest. Right. Well, I right? mean, they stand there and they like they're DJing. They're what not. What can like, they do after? I mean, a while, like maybe right. if you're Marshmallow, you put on a costume and you're like jumping up and yes. down. But like otherwise, DJs are boring. Yeah. So, um, so for a wedding, what's interesting is that what happens with a DJ is that the crowd becomes part of the entertainment. So the people on the dance floor now are looking at each other because there's nothing to look at right. with the DJ. So now the person who might be slightly insecure about themselves, not wanting to be focused on themselves, they're not the selfie Instagram oh, person. Wow. This they is start, interesting. They, they are the focus of the party versus when you have a band then you have two elements of entertainment. You have the music, which people can respond to and dance to, but also those people who don't want to dance or the focus goes on to the band. Yeah. It takes that experience away from the bride and the groom or the client so that they're not the focus on the dance floor. People aren't watching them and their dance moves. They're watching the band. That mindset is and so then, intelligent. And then they're looking also and they're mimicking the band. So I know bands that like have even dancers that are involved. Right. And what's cool is that some they have a show to watch versus them being the show. Yes. So it, it's... It, I've it's never heard important. it broken down like that. That's well, I sell it that way a lot. <laughs> that's really, that's re but that's so, <laughs> that's a solid, solid line. I've right? never thought of it that way. And it's funny because in the band world, they need to remember that because I know a lot of groups that will stick to sheet music or, or whatever, um, which sometimes you have to if somebody's like, learn this song. And, you well, know, of course. Yeah. But, but I, I was asked to, you know, we have a, an orchestra version of us now. Oh yeah, I I booked right. bigger. Which now they they try yeah. to model that after what like Bruno Mars does. So like, and I love you're adding the hip hop singers. Yes, love well not only that, that the, the horn players have players. to learn choreography. Yeah, and then if we have so now it's turned into this, it's just giant show. People but I need did the another show. orchestra. I was I you know I've been asked to do some orchestra um, shows. You know a couple people, are, you know sometimes I'll try to get poached here and there. You know mm -hmm. or at least I'll guest in if I if I have a, a Sunday off and it's a big event. So. I did one orchestra and it was interesting because my mindset is just move. Don't stop moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a show. We're up here. Do the thing. And they, we, you know, just like us for their orchestra, they had four singers, which is typically what, what we'd bring three to four. Uh, but the, whoever was singing was singing. And sometimes they did a whole thing and everybody's kind of doing something. But then there were other points where the three of the singers they had chairs on the stage and they would just sit down. That's so weird. While they weren't singing. I'm like, wait. No, this, no, no. This don't be on the stage. This isn't today. how that, you know. And I didn't know how to, I've never known how to do that. If I'm not singing a song, I'm still up there like kind of. Like, you're always moving. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember, like, looking back because I didn't know. Like, is this a not, this is a real option? <laughs> or maybe he has a bad leg. I don't know. So I'm still dancing and I look back and there's, like, two of the singers and they're looking at their phones. And then they look at me. And then they look like, at each other like, oh, shit, well, I guess we better, you know. <laughs> they gotta you can't be on your phone yeah. in the middle of an event. But my mindset, it's funny that you say the whole, like, then there's a show. My mindset has always been, um, well, first let's talk about, like, a, a, a common mindset for band guys is when no one's interested and no one's dancing, it just happens to be that type of a crowd. Yeah. Then they're just down here the whole time. And they're like, well, nobody cares anyway. And then when the crowd starts responding, then all of a sudden they're doing their best dance moves. Where my mindset is, if nobody's dancing, if nobody's feeling it yet, mm -hmm. you know, they just sat down or they just finished dinner, whatever it is, I'm going to move more during that time because they have nothing to do but watch. So I'm gonna just, if they're not going to dance yet, then I'm going to give them something to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's like my whole mindset. People don't realize that sometimes even though people aren't dancing, they're still participating. Right. Because it's just like when you go to a concert. You're not always dancing and like enjoying the concert that way, but you're enjoying the fact that you have a presentation. And yeah. that is the beauty of a band. Always better with a band than with a DJ. And DJs are specifically great for certain reasons, but... 
I really truly feel for the entertainment value, you get more value out of a band. Yeah, and it's nothing even against them because what? How much can you do? No, when they're, you, they're you're, DJ. St- you're stuck back there, yeah. DJ. You can't they have like a dancers, backup yeah, dancers. Yeah, uh, no, that's can't. like asking a writer, you know, to be behind his laptop. But you know, give me a show while you're doing <laughs> well, that. You know, doing they that. have to do this technical. That's stuff. why, like Marshmallow, dresses up in costumes and jumps up and down <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise <laughs> it's really boring. That's yeah. why we created the laser light shows. I don't. Right? I, I'm not familiar, but I love the name Marshmallow. Okay, so here's here's what I want to get into. Now that you've learned all this and you have all these tricks of the trade, for the clients, like what is your overall approach? They're coming to you, it's their big day. I think the biggest thing that I I contribute to the client's experience is focusing them on what's important and this whole game of priorities. You know, priorities keep changing in life we all keep changing in life and events are essentially experiences that their guests and themselves get to to have and those create memories i say i use i constantly comment because people be like why would i spend so much money on a wedding like you spend like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a wedding that's so much money why would you do that and i'm like well Essentially, we only really remember celebration and trauma. So unless you throw some really great parties, your whole po- whole life's going to be a bunch of traumatic memories, right? <laughs> so let's let's throw some great parties, right? And I, <laughs> but our priorities within those celebrations about what's important to us keeps changing. I love this mindset, dude. Put that on your website. You know? well, no, it's called North Shore Events, or am I? Or like, it I is North Shore Weddings and Events. North Shore yeah. Weddings and Events. We're, you know? we're, we're rebranding because really? as we go to a national okay. company in the next year, yeah. um, it'll be NSWE Events, which is like a weather vane that we're all over. And we're also everywhere. sounds a little bit like a gangster rap yeah, group. Yeah, totally. Yeah. NSWE. And, yeah, but I just love yeah. that that idea. Like, let's remember <laughs> life so you don't just think about death. Like, so- <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's kind of true. It's so true, I though. mean, we all have, the, like, that. as we're going through COVID, yeah. I, like, actually did a video and I, like, that let off the video being like, as we're going through this traumatic time, let's re- think about the parties that we can have. Exactly. And, like, like, celebrations that we have to look forward to. Yeah. I really focus on the, what the client's priorities are. And I like to look at that. And the way my, even my pricing and my packages and the structure of the way the company runs is focused on serving the client. I'm not the least expensive company, but I'm not the most expensive company because I feel that it should be fair pricing. Yeah. People want to know what things cost Mm -hmm. versus having these loose numbers and loose things. I really feel like you have to lead somebody through this process of event planning. When you work with a a client on like, let's say a wedding, they don't typically know what they're going to spend. They don't know what the value is. So they don't know when they see a picture on Pinterest or they see something on Instagram, they don't know what the value associated with that event is. I had one client who had 50 people, Chicago Botanic Garden, cute little wedding. We ended up doing it on a Monday of Memorial Day because that was the only date available. Mm -hmm. And I remember her sharing a picture with me of a picture from the Chicago Botanic Garden. And I looked at her and I said, yeah, that ceiling arrangement that you're showing me costs as much as your entire budget for your wedding. It just puts in perspective that people don't recognize how much things cost. And so a big part of the wedding or event planner's process is managing that client and managing their expectations through that process and understanding what value is. And I feel like a lot of people miss that mark. They just want to like throw great parties with people, but they don't understand that to throw a great party, you have to understand what it is that they value. Sometimes a client really values music and the experience and and that party atmosphere. Sometimes it's all about the aesthetic. I had one client who's a blogger and she's beautiful and her blog is beautiful and everything's beautiful. And so guess what? Her wedding was beautiful (laughs) and everything was so focused on the visual but that was what her priorities are yeah and we have to realize that you know in order to make somebody happy you have to figure out where the priority system works and that's really the difference between what i think i serve versus people who are like just buying stuff because they're like oh well i like their weddings that they're on their website and i'm like you know, that's not my approach. My approach is to figure out who you are as a person and what your priorities are and also who you are uniquely as people because, you know, hopefully we're all not the same. You know, I will do a billion blush and eucalyptus weddings over and over again 
because that's what people are attracted to. But at the end of the day, I know that that's not the majority of the population. <laughs> We're all a little bit different. Yeah. And that's re- really makes me tick. And that's what makes me keep going in this process is figuring out, like, even the music. We talk about events and we have different musical tastes for right. each client. And that's what makes it even, like, that's what makes it exciting for you and I to go to work every day. Yeah. Is that we all have different priorities and we're unique people and that we get to share unique experiences with people. Because if we did the same thing over and over again, it would be like an 80s movie. Now, here's you know? the important thing. <laughs> here's the learning portion of our show. Oh, okay. All right. Because this is, you know, you guys have heard me like if I have a model on, I'm like, what do you do? How do you get them abs? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we have a professional wedding planner on. This is the most important part of the whole show. Okay, I'm right here, right now, we're going to help the world. Right. Heal the world. <laughs> when you're talking about somebody coming in, you and I were just talking about, you know, what happens when a, you know, for instance, that one bride who didn't leave it up to me to try to, you know, I let her know like, hey, here's a song list. But by the way, if you just want to give me your highlights, give me, the more freedom I have, the better I can do my job for your crowd, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. You know, and she said, no, you're playing these songs and in this order. And like I told you off the mic, you have no idea what a crowd is going to feel mm-hmm. at 1045 on a Saturday. No, you you got to vibe you, it. You, you got to vibe it and read it and then move around with that. You know, but she insisted. And for that first hour, nobody danced. And she was so mad. And we had to try to talk. And to that's like, like a reflection on you, but it's not. Right. People are like, it's not your sucks. fault. I'm like, no, no, you got to let Can you let me? Can I throw some <laughs> stuff out there now? Because you see the crowd. You learn how to read the crowd. Yeah. Like, oh, I know. I know what's going to work. It's an art form. It surprises me sometimes. There are songs that I won't even think to put anywhere near the list. And then suddenly at 11 o'clock, I'm like, holy crap. If I do this song right now, they are all singing along. If I do this right now. So you got to read it. But but. That being now, that's that's a slight footnote version. There, there are so many versions of this. What can we tell the future brides or the people who are coming in that might overly focus on that and a possibly hurt the party they want to be so perfect, or b not be able to enjoy their own party because they're so obsessed with planning their party while in the middle of their party? Like, you know, we can help these people. What can you say to them? There is bliss in release. Ooh. There was really a lot of bliss and release. I talked about this with you. We, we did a wedding in Vermont. Yeah. And we have another wedding coming up that, that, that is very similar. I have certain clients who release that control to the professionals. Mm-hmm. And they just trust. I'm paying really top-notch professionals. They know what they're doing. And I'm just going to release the control. And there's a bliss in that. You pay these these professionals and, and sometimes you pay them a lot of money. Trust them because they're going to know how to go and best execute your event. And like we had this Vermont. I remember that Vermont wedding. Yeah. Bride did not attend anything. I planned the whole wedding with mother of the bride. And she released because she was a resident. I mean, we have client. I have a lot of clients who are resident you know, doctors and like, they just don't have the time to go in and control that. Yeah. We get to know each other. I figure out what's going on in their brain, who they are as people, and then they just release it. Trust. And they get to show up and be like pleasantly surprised. And I think if more people in life allowed themselves to walk into a situation and just allow themselves to release and just yeah. say, Hey, it's okay to be specific because like, I don't care, you know, from my point of view, I don't care if you like pink or purple or blue or whatever it is. I'll design it to whatever you want it to be. Yeah, because the end result is always the same. If they're hiring professionals, you know, if I get hired, I notice if it's somebody who has faith in us and does the release thing or it's somebody that's so meticulous, they're all just caught up in it for the entire night. At the end of it, they're both equally as happy. And all I keep thinking is, oh man, the person who was overly meticulous, they're just as thrilled at the end because all their friends told them how great it was. But all I keep thinking is, that's great, I'm so glad but you could have been with your friends. <laughs> yeah, instead of controlling the whole situation. Because the end result is always good. If you're dealing with professionals, you're going to be okay, you know? Yeah. No, we. I think the people don't recognize that when you're dealing with at least high-level professionals, yeah. and that's why you spend a lot of money on certain things that are your priorities. Sometimes they're not your priorities. But if, like, a band and music is your priority, then spend more money on it. Right. People forget that, like, they are trained professionals and their job is to make you happy. That is my job. Yeah. My job is not to plan 
the wedding of my dreams because I do like 20 events. I do 20 weddings a year. Trust me, I've done the wedding of my dreams in 15 different ways. You know, it's not my wedding of my dreams. It's your wedding of your dreams. And I'm here to execute it at the top level of what you want it to be. And that's the same thing for you as like a band or all the different professionals. Right. They're looking at it as how do I do this the best possible way? Yeah. You know, if, if they're, if they're crappy at what they do, then they're going to like do a crappy job. But like, I'm not going to direct my clients to crappy professionals and the professionals who really take pride in their work, they're going to look to go and how do I craft it? So stop controlling it so much. Yeah. I, I call it like handcuffing the DJ or handcuffing the band. Yeah. Like, why would you handcuff anybody? Right. You know, even at the event designers, like, I will be very specific with them and be like, hey, this is exactly how I want it. These are the flowers that I want. And I'll, I'll be specific because I know what the client's vision is. But I have also had, had to learn how to give up some control, too, where I have to let myself be pleasantly surprised. Here's the thing, people. Then what did you just learn? I think what, what the lesson is, whatever professional you hire listen to them, listen to what they're saying. And if what they're saying is more, okay, well, I think you should go with, and I think you should go with, yeah, that's but different if, if than they're what coming in saying, yeah, should. what do you love? What do you envision for your night? If they're saying that, that's your person, yeah. wherever you are. If you're not anywhere here, if you're not working with myself or Megan, just listen for that. There's, there's your big lesson. It should be a reflection of what you're saying. Yeah, Cause I've seen a lot of those. I've seen a lot of the planners. I've been in some of the meetings that I, I don't even know why I'm in, but there's why certain, are you even in those? I meetings? don't know. Are, I have they, like my process oh, is so streamlined. There are times, you know, our process, our process is smooth so smooth. Silk. When we work oh. together, like I tell you, yes, I'd be like, I got to cover. I'll give you all the information you need. You ask the right questions, we figure it out. But like, I also set up a process right. for my clients to streamline it so that like, let's not waste our time. You're well, one of three. So we do about 40 weddings a year. You're one yeah. of three planners out of, I don't know how many planners we work with. That it, it, it's it's muscle memory for us to send that question form. Oh yeah, and I always be you're like, you're one of three I'm who we don't have to that. right. That it, it, it can go in the garbage, but typically we're sending out this questionnaire which tells us all about the wedding because even even some of the best most uh, high priced planners. Don't, don't get all the details right and we always no. end up you know we had to figure out all right these are the 10 things they still don't tell us i don't care if they're working for you know uh, the highest politician in office or whatever it's just crazy and so then like, you ask me like you're like how do i take care of this how do i and i'm like yeah. it's on there it's on there. yeah it's on there. It's, it's, don't worry it's it's in there it, it's it yeah so that's a thing but anyway i just had to get that out there so now now you folks know now you've learned something haven't you absolutely but the COVID thing is crazy. So let's talk about that. And, and oh, no. for anybody who's like, if it's five years from when this thing was uh, launched and you're one of the, my bingers, I love you bingers. We're and still going to be affected by COVID I love five years <laughs> from now. Don't say that. No. Let's be Didn't. honest. But you bingers, I love you because I've been, I've been made well aware of the fact that people find these episodes sometimes years later and they're still binging them. But here's the thing. If um, I'm talking to the future, you folks, if, if COVID's not going on when you listen to this, um, you're still going to get a, a lesson in how to deal with crap because, man, I've never seen a, a curveball like COVID. I don't know how, how it played out for you. It was um, I heard about it in February. You know, you started hearing with yeah. relation to our industry. And then sometime, I think March 7th, I did my final big, big show. Big and then yeah. maybe I had a, a smaller gig a few days later. And it was two we days. Weren't, we weren't really no. like conceptualizing it. No, it was instantaneous. I saw my, my calendar. First, the calendar got pushed. Things were getting pushed. And it looked like, well, in June, we'll probably be. And then, uh, oh, July will be back. And yeah, well, okay, what? this sucks, but it looks like the fall. And now it's just like, okay, there's no 2020. You're going to do a handful of weddings. They're gone. Well, we've done a lot of, we're doing a lot of weddings in 2020. We're, I mean, for, it, for, for the situation right. but i have to give myself a lot of credit that like we're doing them in illinois because of the efforts that i made so on march i think it was march 7th i flew to new york went to a friend's record release party i was in a nightclub in new york city uh -huh. flew home the next day the following day flew out to las vegas went to a conference for event planners oh, wow. from like the 9th to the 13th and proceeded to, on March 12th, 
was when I had a wedding in Vail on March 27th. And I got a notification from the florist in Vail that Vail, Eagle County had been shut down to less than 50 people for events, including staff. And I was like, what? It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. I was like nursing a hangover from the like the <laughs> conference party the night before. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> I mean, everything was done. The things for like the hotel bags to like hand it out to the guests as they check in were there. Like the uh, paperwork was done. Everything was done for the wedding. All I had to do was show up to this wedding and run it. I mean, we were done. Yeah. And then I had to shut down and like reprogram and plan this whole wedding. Like, where are we going to move to Chicago? What are we going to do? Like, how are we going to redo this? Because at Chicago at the time hadn't been shut down yet. I went to like 250. Okay. Like three days later. And it was like, okay, we can still do Chicago. Let's like reroute the band. We're going to like reroute all the vendors and everything. Like, no. (laughs) And then March 13th, they shut down the schools in Chicago. Everybody was done. And I was like, oh my God, what is going to happen to our industry? So I went into like just planning mode of like all right we got three months like this is probably going to be affecting us what's going to happen and i started the postponements you guys went through the postponements like yeah. everybody went like, like we gotta start postponing but how long is it going to be april through october of 2021 i am so booked <laughs> because everything's been moved like so many weddings have been moved and and those special events have 2021 is gonna be a bang it's, up it's year for be, parties yeah. let me tell you there's a lot of parties everybody's moved. going to a lot of parties it, it, it's nuts yeah so we moved all these events <laughs> and then what happened to me was i i was really freaked out by because you obviously you can tell from even the conversation i'm very involved in this whole events industry I care about all these people that work. Yeah. You know, I knew the housekeepers. I knew the banquet servers. I knew all these people. And, like, I really do care about the, each individual that works in this industry because I really do feel that they're important to how we all sustain our business. And, like, we're all interconnected. And I love those people. And I want to support them. And so when I realized that this was not a temporary situation, it was, like, about April. I remember getting out of the shower in the morning one morning and was like, holy shit. Like, if we don't do something about this in Illinois, like, they could just give us the most ridiculous guidelines and we could just be shut down for the next year. Yeah. So I freaked out for like a moment and then I started texting like friends of mine and emailing friends of mine who were politically connected people. Like, I have a friend of mine who's a great guy, owns this, runs this, like, non-for-profit, but, like, and he has done all this political campaigning. I was like, what do we do about my industry? We uh-huh. don't have a lobby. We don't, we're not the NRA. Right. And he goes, you can reach out to the governor and the mayor and express your opinion and gather a group of individuals in the events industry. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And so I did. I started sending out emails to everybody in the events industry and been like uh, owners of businesses being like, hey, I'm going to go and write to the governor and the mayor. And I think that we need to all gather together and we need to support each other and say, hey, you know, this restriction that you've put upon our industry is going to be long lasting. It's going to be really harsh Mm -hmm. because you got to remember when COVID shuts down events that doesn't just affect like your weddings and your events and having people over your house. It's an entire industry of conferences, conventions, hotel meetings, um, meetings of people in general, along with weddings and social events. Yeah. And there is a huge billions, billions of dollars of industry across the United States and even in, in the, in Chicago and Illinois that are affected by that. The hotels still aren't open. We're, we're at a certain time period, like they're still not open and it affects all these people's jobs. And it's not, and I foresaw it because of my experience working in hotels and understanding how these levels of positions that work. And I was like panicked. So 
gathered people together and then I talked to the Illinois Events Coalition which was being created by Ali Phillips and Michelle Dupretti and they were like well, what, do you, what do you want to do and I was like I want to write letters to the governor and the mayor like tomorrow right. and they were like well we want to do these other things and I was like okay I'm going to write letters to the governor so you do that I'm going to do this and I ended up connecting with NACE National which is the National Association of Catering and Events mm-hmm. which is like the biggest and oldest probably events industry uh, association a lot of people don't know about because it's more about education than connecting people and networking but I reached out to them I connected with the president and they said hey will you let me do this under under you guys and he was like sure and so I ended up writing all these letters to the governor and the mayor and I got all support of all the biggest you know companies in Chicago in the events industry and I at the same time, I got the most amazing partner in crime, who is this woman, Juan Teague. And Juan is just a badass. Let uh-huh. me just tell you, this woman, is, she owns a company called Juan and Only Events. And she had posted something on Facebook of being like, I'm worried about all these people in the industry. What are we going to do? What are we, how are these people going to pay their rents? Yeah. These DJs to promoters to all these different people. And I was like, Juan, come on with me. Because I knew. Juan and I worked in hotels years ago. I knew her experience in the industry. She, first of all, knows everybody in Chicago, Chicago politics, but also she knows celebrities and all these different people. And I was like, I need you. Can you come on with me? And she was like, yeah, I'll come on with you. What do I need me to do? I was like, I need you to call everyone you know. <laughs> I will sit here and write letters and paperwork and I will organize and I will be administrative but you need to be I need you to get on the phone because you know everyone in the world a week two weeks later we got a response and we got into the working groups for the city of Chicago to write the guidelines for the city of Chicago she happened to be in a running group with the lieutenant governor's it was the lieutenant governor's assistant uh-huh so she was like like running and exercising every day with this woman who then made sure that our letters got pres- presented to the governor. And we were able to get the event industry recognized by the governor and the mayor's office because of her efforts. I mean, I, I did a lot of work, but I have to give the credit to Juan. She really got wow. on the phone and worked hard. So from that, we ended up getting into these working groups. Juan and I kind of wrote the whole guidelines on how to reopen the For state of events. Illinois and Ill- in Chicago, how to how to conduct events in Illinois wow. during COVID. Now, is that the kind of the rules, the like on-site the rules, rules used, yeah. with the distance and the really? Mm-hmm. The truth of the matter is, is that we just have to get to a point where people can protect themselves. Yeah. And if they can protect themselves, then it's not. If they choose not to protect themselves, then they can also choose not to attend events. Yeah. They can choose not to attend events, and they can look at their workplace and say, I can't attend that conference because I choose not to get a vaccine. And if they choose not to take a vaccine, then we're going to have these virtual options that we've really developed, and they're going to be great, and they're all going to be able to participate. Have in. you done any of those, by the way? So I've gotten Oh, paid. we do streaming. Yeah, yeah I've totally. I've gotten paid to sing virtually for the virtual gala like you know we were going to have something in phoenix or wherever it was going to be i don't remember but yeah. instead you know there i was in my living room like for sure wish <laughs> i could be there and here's a song phoenix, here you go and we all just like do our song <laughs> we had to play you know we recorded our parts from home and they put it all together so i've done a couple of those virtual galas that's been interesting yeah it's it's, it's just gonna weird, be you know? over though i don't speak too much on my opinions on stuff i don't get political on the show and stuff the only thing i would say is man i sure do wish whatever Whatever this thing is, because some people are um, really hardcore one way or the other. You know, my, my personal opinion has kind of been something's happening. I yeah. see it. So my, my personal approach has always been I'm I am going to be better safe than sorry. So I yeah. do the distance thing. I'm not, like you know, we've been distanced today. Right, but, but if I'm like around talking. anyone, I kind of trust, you know, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really around too many people, which, by either. the way, it's kind of nice too. wait. Isn't we this? were talking about how. <laughs> B- b- was the, there was the break from yes. COVID. Oh man, yeah, we're gonna get like, on that too. Nice. My, my only, <laughs> so my only opinion on this has been, oh, what sucks is whatever it was. Oh, America! <laughs> if only we would have just, whether you believe in it or not, if we would have like played it cool for two months, just two months, we probably would have been okay. 
and then, like the first two weeks. Do you remember like the first two weeks of this when you're like well, it, the first uh, two weeks when we were all scared though? Do you even, remember when you we were? You can't even um, like say that though because I have to say we shut down. Like everybody's got their own politics, but yeah. like we shut down all across the country, even in states but where we it hadn't affected did. it. it but, but like where it, it didn't even be affected. Yeah, we should have had a more structured approach to shutting down. Yeah, when September 11th happened, happened, we closed all flights for how long but that was a yeah. unified that like, was like a unified like unified, whoa something it, happened it was a unified message whereas when covid first hit it like, was like you, mixed you, messaging yeah constantly. do you remember yeah do you remember the first like seven days when when we were all like freaking out like i remember thinking like you know oh no it's gonna get us it's outside like it was like a <laughs> zombie movie but then i remember saying okay i'm gonna quarantine for these first seven days but and, like, and then i guess the as soon as i got in my car i passed a park and there are 20 dudes playing basketball all over each other. Like, oh, so I've, that's my only disappointment is whatever this thing is, we should have all rolled the dice for like a month. But, but yeah. we got to get through this. And like yeah. my my opinion is for my industry, I want us to work. Right. I want the events industry to work. Want yeah, yeah. I want them to be supported. And yeah. we did get grant money for the, uh, the state of Illinois. So the state of Illinois is the only state that I know of that mm -hmm. has secured grant money for the special events industry. Wow. Only state. And it's because of the efforts of the Illinois Events Coalition, which is Michelle Drapetti and Ali Phillips and myself and Juan Teague. Yeah. We have secured money for event businesses. And I, I am really proud of that. Like it makes me really happy to know that like most of 85% of the businesses in the special events industry are single business owners like myself. Yeah. And the idea that they can have some money coming in as grant money is just so inspiring. I didn't know if I really thought that much about Illinois politics until I got into <laughs> this situation. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that you're not just talking about the 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 top of the mountain. You know, you're you're the you're the general of this military kind of strike that has to happen at these <laughs> events. Yet you are constantly going back to you know the wait staff, and you're constantly you know. And like I, we, I like we, that. We it, support everybody. There are a lot of people that we have to worry about during this time. It's and it's yeah. me. And I said thank you for caring about me. My kids are fed and lived and raised off of events. And although yes, the hotels won't benefit from this, but we have to continually press this mentality that like hotels or travel or or events are superfluous because they're not. Yeah. They're necessary to our economy. I really hope that in the future we can, as an events industry, really build a lobby and a uh, organization to be able to go in press government to recognize that we are a significant part of the economy we're larger than the manufacturing industry yeah i mean think about that it's nice like, to know think about like the hospitality industry the travel hospitality events industry uh -huh. is larger than manufacturing in the united states i think i was aware and of yet that. at the same time we have no lobby how can you not have representation for this entire group of people who yeah. are hardworking individuals who really do care and take care of us? Well, it's good that you're, you're, you went in to get that represented, too. It's funny. When you say that you started writing letters and getting you know involved with like government entities and whoever yeah. you could find, like that, it's so funny, but that's definitely who you are because as soon as you were saying it, I pictured... <laughs> the girl who went out and hustled to get a pizza delivery job. I'm like, wow, you're still the same. Or you're hustling, hustling and you're going. Night. Like, seriously, you're like, going, you're working, you're going, you know. Well, and, and man, you know, and, and I always want to, like, throw, you know, love and care to anybody that had a hard run that got hit. I know some people that have been hit yeah. really hard with it. Uh, totally. And, you know, it, it's so funny because everyone keeps saying, oh, it's, you know, you got to be pre-existing. You know, what, I think that I'm starting to see these two battlegrounds where yeah. some people are saying, ah, it's fine. It's going to go away in no time. And then other people are, are, like, way militant, like, you know, you can get it from being in the other state. And if you just talk, you know, it's so yeah. insane. But what I, you know, my person personal experience with it now that I've seen some people get it like I know a couple both very very healthy one took a kid to a, a, a hockey practice that that team got infected they yeah. both got it same age healthy people the, um, the husband felt a little tired for two days no big deal 
The wife ended up in the hospital, laid oh, out no every way. symptom. Thank God she finally <sighs> pulled out of it, but she was a wreck. What I'm starting to notice is it's not as cut and dry as saying like, oh, no. it's nothing or, oh, it's just pre-existing. I think it's kind of a bee sting thing. I think yeah. you're either allergic to the bee sting or you're not. You're either going to get stung and it's going to hurt and yeah, that sucked. Or you're going to get it like, and your face is going to pop up. up. Yeah. yeah. I think it's more that. I'm not a doctor, but I, no, you know, I get it. Yeah. Which again, kind of keeps me in the whole, all right, I'm gonna, just going to be better Let's be safe cautious. than sorry. Yeah. Let's be cautious. So let me tell you that. Let me ask you this thing, because we did talk about the, the funny thing is, um, uh, you know, you, you hope that there's a silver lining somewhere. I God, I hope I hope most. I hope there everyone is. out so there have there have found something from this. But has there any has anything good come from this experience? You know, my 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 big thing is I never had a summer with my family. Never. I know. know. <laughs> Me either. I've, I've we never were just had a summer. Talking about the vegetable garden, I'm like. I've never been able to grow a vegetable garden. But I'll I still go, didn't this summer. Because I'll go I'm a, further. Um, but like we never have time to spend our t- uh, with our families. And this is an interesting year. The the industry that we're in, it, it, it's in order to keep working, we have to be we have to pay so much care to every need. And I mean, I, again, I'm the band guy, maybe because I'm MC, too. There are times where somehow somehow I'm brought into like meetings with with uh, brides and grooms. I'm talking to them six or seven times from May, you know, through June through July, and the wedding's like in December. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm, I've been I've been forced Which to go is to wrong. like you, you should not be brought in. Oh that my much, gosh! But, and it's like um, what is happening? I'm so my, so my big thing is um, there was a time last year around January where I was talking to another band leader mm-hmm. and saying, man, I just, I don't know if I have another summer in me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got and the then it was summer. Gone. You got <laughs> like, the I summer. I remember thinking like, wait, wait, I didn't, I was like screaming to this guy. I didn't mean right, like the whole summer. summer. Hold on. You, you know, know what? But, but I will say there was, was a really part of me that was getting the burn. I was getting a little burnt out. Um, because I'm not, you know, as you know, you know, in this world where we're so many things, you know, I'm definitely not just a singer going on stage. It's just so much, it, and I, I was getting a little tired and, and, and it gave me a, a breath, you know, I mean, it's scary, but I've also tried to prepare myself so I could be ready for something like this. Thank goodness. I, I feel so bad for my friends. A lot of my friends who are hurting badly, yeah. who are living maybe paycheck to paycheck or hadn't. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm in a dual income relationship, but also I've, I've always been prepared for a bad year. But yeah, there's, that's, that's the only shiny spot for me has been, oh, wow. I, I, got a I, break. I, I, I spent a summer with my family. It never happened, you know? Well, and I appreciated that as well. Although my lifestyle didn't change because I went from being event planner to <laughs> lobbyist, lobbying yeah. advocate yeah, yours for didn't like change. full so, time from home so with kids. So was there anything that... And, uh, no, but like the beauty of it is that I did get a new perspective of being able to spend some more time at home and recognizing how I can prioritize my time. And it yeah. actually helped me with my clients even for the future. Like even I'll like look at clients now, I'll say, do we really need to meet in person? Do we really? Cause I, this is a call. This is a call. This right. appointment is a call. And my business model is actually based off of the amount of in-person appointments. So like, we were able to structure it much more clearly based off of these in-person calls. So, but like it was, it was challenging at first. Oh, at first it was. A, it was yeah. really challenging. I was to, falling into a mild de- depression at first because yeah. you, you know. At the end of the day, though, I am a single mother mm-hmm. of two kids. They're nine and ten years old, and I have to work my ass off to support two kids. I don't have any support. I don't have the ability to just look at and be like, oh, well, it's just a shitty year. Right. You know, like there are so many wedding planners who are like, oh, I just I guess it's going to be a shitty year. Or like, just yeah. skip to next year. And I'm like, that's great. Your job is a hobby. <laughs> My job is not a hobby. My job supports, it's not superfluous. It yeah, is yeah. how I support my children. And like, it really was cool because it also did identified how this industry needs to re-examine who they are. Yeah. And if you look at your job as a hobby, I personally feel like you need to re-examine 
your job. And even with bands, even like you guys with bands. Weekend Warriors. Uh, there's some, Weekend Warriors right. of the bands and versus the people who like live and breathe this. They support their children. They support their families off this. Yeah. Like my, this is my like every day. Right. I live and breathe events. So when I see people like being like, oh, well, I'll just take a break from events for six months because of COVID. I'm like, dude. Do you know how that affects the whole world? What's impressive is I mean, that you... It's different. The stuff that... The, what's impressive is that the things that you did outside of, of your job, you know, it's not like you were getting paid to write those letters. It's not no, like you were getting know. paid to do all that research. I don't but know. what I like about it is it's so hard sometimes to to not let, you know, the depression of the situation kind of get you down. And who knows, you know, that sometimes no matter what we try may fail and we might just be screwed. But the, the idea of like not stopping and to search for every option and, and every, every, you, you were, you were looking for every open door and then you were trying to go to closed doors even and open them up. Like, I love the fact that you like hit the ground running with this situation as opposed to kind of sitting back and waiting to see what happens or just letting kind of the down feelings just take over. I love the fact that you were proactive all the way through. And like you said, whether it works or not, you did not stand still i mean if anything that's the lesson for years and generations to come whether it's a covid situation whether it's anything else you know i think the key the walk away is just don't stop man don't stop there is no limitation to the capability of an individual yeah and people think that they are not capable of anything and what I you mean like I once just, they get that wall put in front of them so many people well, they like just, shut down they and, don't even think about the they think about the wall before it even happens yeah i started to get involved in government and political fundraising in 2019 and i had a client that was really passionate about the democratic party and he wanted to throw parties. He had already thrown events and parties for the Democratic campaign for presidents. And then I got involved in that and I was helping him out with that because I felt I have a skill and I have ability to help a certain demographic with my skill set. Right. And I had the ability to get donated product. And so that I did that. And then it came to Bloomberg reached out and said, hey, can you help me? And I was going to help them. But then they didn't make it ever to the point of being close to nomination. And then we hit COVID. And I couldn't do any fundraising further from that point for other campaigns that were looking for fundraising. But I think that we all have to look at like we all have talents and we all have skills and although it may seem limited because of life and like the way we look at our lives really the world is much bigger than we think it is and that's what I've learned from COVID is that although I thought oh my god who am I gonna I'm gonna write governors and mayors that are gonna listen to me yeah I'm gonna write these letters are they gonna listen to me they did they actually did. They involved us in government. So don't and put yourself in a box. Don't put yourself in a box. Don't think that you're not capable of doing what you can do. But recognize, though, that you have a constituency, that you have people around you, and that they care about you. And that they also care about themselves, and you have to balance that. And don't ever think that government doesn't matter. I think that so many people think that like it's not important to vote. And like, it's not important to speak up about government or like, but I've learned, I mean, I have, we have grants for the special events industry because of people speaking out about the special events industry yeah, in Illinois. Yeah. It all came because of a persistency of just saying like, we care, we care, we have to care. Some people also need to stop thinking about the bottom line. Because when crisis happens, it's not about the bottom line. It's about your industry. I see a year in 2021 as being very successful. Right. And 2022 is going to be very successful for my own company because the efforts that I made. And so shutting down and restricting yourself is never a positive attitude yeah. for any business. Just That's a worldview right there. Right? Yeah, that's everything. That's everything. 
Yeah. Listen to that. Nice. You guys have learned it all. Did you have fun today? Yeah, I had so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man, the layers of this. You're you're uh, an impressive individual, man. Seriously, Thank you I'm so I'm much, so glad man. I learned so much. And uh, so r- right now, where can people find you? Where would you guide people? Well, go to NorthShoreEvents.com. And you might be rebranding. Well, just type in MeganEstrada.com and it leaves yeah. you to our Google, website. Google Megan Estrada. You will find her. She will take care of you. I don't even have to sell her product because you just <laughs> heard it, man. I mean, it, when, once you get to know what somebody's about, that's that's when you want to work with them. Now you know what she's all about. So if you didn't know her, you know her now. I'm sure you love her. Because now you know her. You know her. You love her. That's Megan Estrada. Thank Thanks you, guys. So Thank you for hanging out. Thank you I love so you much. very much, man. Know, You're always great. just a pleasure. And this was a long time coming. You know, it's not even about the mics. It was good to spend an <laughs> afternoon with you. This is awesome. We had fun. We had too much All fun right. here. So uh, right. hopefully you guys are doing well. Uh, if the world is still strange while you listen to this, well, just do your best, man. Hang in there. Keep your chins up. We love you very much. Uh, In the meantime, thank you for listening. Have a great month. Have a great week. Have a great day. Go out and find your smile. You did it. (laughs) Welcome to my life so far. You'd think by now I'd be a star. I may be long-winded, but hey, there's just so much I have to say. Maybe lick your lips when you're hungry Maybe drop your head when you're sorry Maybe shake a bit when you're worried That's just